and forget what peace actually feels like. But there is a way, a way for hope to break through our walls, a way for our faith to be renewed, a way for comfort to surround us. We can once again feel the light shine brightly on our face. We can experience the warmth of God's love and watch the darkness be overcome. For it's in the light of Jesus we find peace. Well, good morning. We are talking about a subject today that I know more about than anyone in here. We're going to talk about distraction. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 10 today, and I would encourage you to once again to read that on your own. There's stories that I'm not going to go over today, but um, three of the stories I'm going to talk about all involve distraction. Uh, How many of you ever feel easily distracted? Did you not hear me and you didn't raise your hand? Okay. (laughs) Chad's like, what? What? Anyway, it's good to see you guys today. So we're going to talk about being and doing, or as I like to say, dooby dooby doo. And uh, uh, so we're going to talk about the distractions of being and doing. So years ago, and I've told this story a few times, I'll tell the short version. Uh, Years ago, I, in junior high, was asked to be in high school band. And the reason the band director asked me is that uh, he needed somebody to play cymbals. And so I played for the, I guess, spring concert. And so we did like, you know, the overture of whatever it is, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, or as I call it, the Bad News Bears song. And um, I don't blame you. This, this is a sad story. I saw one of Randy's children headbutt him, and I thought, I know that feeling. Ricky used to headbutt me all the time. Still does, and he's 20-something now. Uh, anyway, so um, there you go. Distractions. Easily distracted. So, um, so I got to be in high school band. So for the thing, the, 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 at first he gave me music. But then he decided, I think, he wanted me to play cymbals more than the music stated. So he put me over on the side of the stage, kind of over here, and the band director was here, and the band was pretty much here. And uh, so he would point at me, so it would be like, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and he'd point at me. And it looked like magic, because he'd do that, and my hair was long in the front, you know, this was the early 80s. And uh, so it did this every time, so it was like he was going like this, and my hair was flying up, and he was da 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 and uh, so that was fine. And so we did that concert. And of course, it was great because I got to be in high school band with high school girls. And so the clarinets and the flute players thought I was cute. So they would talk to me. So band was great. I would bring a ham sandwich every day. And during lunch, I would actually go to high school band. I'd go across campus to the other campus and go to high school band. By the way, a few years ago, I told this story. The band director actually listened to the story. And he said these words. Eric, it wasn't half, it was, it was twice as funny as you made it sound. He said it was unbelievable, the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life, which I love. And you can find that somewhere on my Facebook is that, him saying that. He's passed away since then, but such an awesome statement. Um, and we used to call him Uncle Bob, by the way, Bob Heath. But anyway, so, so Uncle Bob. And uh, so the Christmas concert's coming, and what happened is during the, I wish Laura was here this morning because she would know that, she'll be here next service, uh, because uh, she went to my high school. And uh, what would happen is the choir would sing first, and then the band would play. So the choir parents did not have a lot of um, niceness. And so they would leave between the... the so the, the audience was half gone for the band concert. It was terrible. So the band parents had to come to the dumb choir people thing... But the choir parents would take off. And so what they decided to do this year, they were going to fix that. By the way, it's the last time they ever did this. So they put uh, um, stands out front, and they had the choir out front, and then on the wooden stage, they closed the big green curtains, because my high school's colors were green and white. So they closed the big green curtains, and um, so now I'm wearing a suit, because for the Christmas concert, we had to wear a suit. And so, um, um, you know, they put my cymbals on this flat, table. So I'm back there talking to you. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, it's good. You know, and the flute players are talking to me. Hey, how's it going? And I think I'm cute and I'm probably not, but uh, uh, they like dorks apparently. And so um, one of the guys says, hey, that's the last song. You need to get ready because I had to get the cymbals and go over there. So um, 
let me set the stage just a little here. The, the choir is out front, in front of the curtains, on a wooden stage, <clears throat> and they're singing of all songs. They're singing a song called, Enter the Stable Gently. <clears throat> True. Enter the stable gently. Remember that. You're going to need that in just a moment because I turned around to pick up the cymbals and this time I was wearing a jacket and there are three buttons on your jacket. You can blame Napoleon for that. He didn't like his soldiers wiping their noses. And so, as, that's true. Look it up. Google it. So, so I reached around to get it and my button on my jacket caught one of the cymbals and threw it on the ground. But it didn't just throw it on the ground, it threw it on the ground on the edge of the symbol, and the symbol ran across the stage. So I ran after the symbol, and then the symbol started doing, have you ever tried to catch a garbage can lid? Wing, wing, wing. So I did what every football player would know to do, fumble, and so I jumped on the symbol. Now, out front was a little different look because Mrs. Willoughby was directing everybody and all of a sudden, enter the stable gently. Bing, wing, boom, 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 wing, 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 It was so bad that the students were picking up the curtain to see what was going on. There's actually a video somewhere with that on it. And um, I'm so thankful that the internet was not existent, was non existent at that point. And because um, I've seen the kid that accidentally hits the symbol and it bounces and hits somebody in the face, I would have been a meme. And um, what's funny is the band director thought this was hilarious. He's sitting there watching this. And he even, you know, 30 years later told me it was the most hilarious thing he ever saw. And the high school uh, drummer picked me up and carried me off the stage, which I was grateful for, because I was like, I do not want to appear after this. So I felt like it was my excuse, so I just hid down in the corner thinking, nobody will know. And it wasn't so bad until it was time now, the curtains opened immediately after the choir was done with that song, and the band director could not control himself. He was laughing so hard that people said they could see his belly shaking from behind. And so the clarinets picked up on that. And I don't know if you know anything about clarinets. Anybody in here ever played a clarinet? So a clarinet and laughter do not go well together. I don't know if you knew that. And so instantly they started playing whatever song it was. I don't remember, uh, uh, you know, let's go for a hayride or whatever it was. And, <laughs> and once they started laughing, then the trumpets and the tubas were laughing into their instruments. People, it, it ruined Every song. There was not a good song from, the, and I could hear this from the floor, and I'm thinking, I'm glad I'm not up there. <laughs> and so I go to leave, I'm thinking, nobody will know. And I'll never forget, Mr. Marsingill uh, 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 tracked me down, and he said, That was you that dropped the cymbals, wasn't it? I knew you were in the spring concert, and now that had to be you. And I just went <laughs> and ran out of the room, and I was done. All of that happened. And people, by the way, still remember that. I thought everybody would forget. I went to my 20th, not 10th, not 15th, 20th reunion. And Drew Dixon, who was the president of our class for years, walked up to me. And one of the first things out of his mouth was not, hi, Eric, how you doing? It was, do you remember that time you dropped the cymbals? Dude, that was in junior high. You're killing me. Now I know how Downing Thomas is going to feel in heaven. It was one time, dude. That was one so I say all that to say this, if you're not careful as a Christian, you'll know what's right, you'll understand that you should love God, but you will get so busy with other things, with other thoughts, with other distractions, that you will focus on all the wrong things and miss, listen, the most important thing. So my question for you today that I want you to ask is, why do you do what you do? When it comes to serving Christ, when it comes to doing what God wants you to do, why do you do it? And don't forget the why in what you're doing. And so let's pick this up today. So here's, our, here's the three distractions we're going to talk about. Number one, many things or the main thing. On one occasion, it says in Luke chapter 10, picking up in verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. By the way, this word for test is the exact same Greek word that was used when Jesus was in the desert and Satan tempted him. And I don't think that's on accident. It's basically he was trying to test Jesus. And, and this is a little different than the other time that Jesus had this discussion. 
Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So part of that comes from, and how it's written, comes from the Old Testament. That's from the uh, uh, part of the Pentateuch, part of the first five books of the Bible. And so he says that, and Jesus says, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. Now listen to what the religious leader says next. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And what he was hoping is that Jesus would narrow down the definition of neighbor to be, oh, I don't know, people you like, people who are convenient, issues that happen in life that are, you know, just easy to take care of. But Jesus, as we're going to see in a minute, doesn't do that. He uh, uh, tries to get us distracted. Now realize that what Jesus was teaching, the Pharisees and the Sadducees not only had the law from the Pentateuch, the first five books, they had written, extra written laws, but they also had written extra oral laws. And um, there was this guy named Gamaliel who was around, and you've probably heard of him because that was Paul's teacher. If you talk to a Jewish rabbi today and you say, who was the last rabbi of the oral law, they'll most likely name this guy Gamaliel. Because not only did they have written laws, not only did they have the Bible, but they added to Scripture with their own laws, and then they added oral laws. Things like you can only take your donkey so far on the Sabbath. You can only walk so many steps. Uh, from the Old Testament, they made it into, uh, uh, you can't have cheeseburgers. And that's because there's a verse in the Old Testament that says you can't have a cow cooked in his mother's milk and the cheese might accidentally be from the mom. Why? That's, that's why it's there. And so they had all these extra rules on top of rules and what became important was not loving God. What became important were these lists. They had lists of things and lists of things and lists of things. And the list became the focus and they forgot about God, and they forgot about people. And they would even use their law to manipulate what they had to do so they didn't have to help people. So that in times they really didn't want to help people, they'd be like, well, that person's unclean. I'm just going to walk over here because I've got to stay clean. And they would utilize the law to actually justify them not caring. Or them not wanting to help somebody. Jesus actually got on to them about them doing that with their mom. Because what they would do with their mothers is when their mothers got older and, and their mothers needed help. They would say, mother, I give you to God. And then they would do nothing else for their mother. They'd say, you're God's problem now. That's one of the things they did. Isn't that great? Just the love of Jesus in them, right? <laughs> anyway, okay. So here's what happens to us as believers. One of the things I've noticed is one of two things happens. Number one, there's people who don't do anything. And the reason they don't do anything many times is because they were hurt. Or the other extreme is they try to do everything. And the reason, by the way, they do nothing now may be because at one point they tried to do everything. Both of those are wrong. And so when they try to do everything, they think every little thing. After a while, guess what? You get burned out. Why? Because you're doing things and you're not loving people. It was really funny last night, a guy came up to me and I think he was embarrassed, but um, he came up to me and he said, uh, hey, I'm helping at another church. And I think he thought I was going to say, oh no, that's our competition. But I said, oh, oh, that's that pastor I know. I know the pastor there. He's great. Tell him I said hi. <laughs> you should have seen his face like, what? He's like, well, they have a homeless ministry that we don't have. I said, that's great. Go help them with their homeless ministry. Guess what? Every month, every single month, at least once a month, somebody comes to me and says, I've got this idea for a ministry. And my first question is always, so how many hours a week do you want to serve in that ministry? And they go, oh, no, I meant for you to do it. You, you're going to do that ministry, right? Nope, nope, nope. By the way, if you think I'm talking to you, it's not, you're not the only one, right, Peggy? And so, and so we have, sorry, Peggy, <laughs> Peggy's like, oh, you had to call me out. But, but here's the truth. Listen, 
I want you to do what God's called you to do. But what you are called to do doesn't mean that everybody else is called to do it. And dying churches tend to do one of two things. They either do nothing or they try to do everything. And I've actually seen the second more than the first. Churches that spread themselves so thin that they burn people out and then nobody helps with anything. And so you choose and you say, God, what do you want me to do? And then can I tell you what to do when God tells you to do it? Do it. If he calls you to do something, do it. And if we don't have a place for you to do it, I'll help you find a place to do it. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not in competition with the church in Titusville that's helping homeless people. We actually love to go and help them when we can and say to them, hey, we're here for you. How can we help you? What can we do for you? When they've gone through times of trial, we've given them equipment. We've gone out of our way to help them. And so look for those opportunities. There's nothing wrong with going out of your way to bless others. Right, Peggy? Okay, there we go. So here's what I want you to do instead. I want you to take time every day to praise and thank God continually. Why? Because that will refocus you when you get focused. By the way, we all tend to be Simon Cowell in our head. Do you know who that is? That's the guy who's like, that was terrible. I can't do his, I sound like Charles Barkley when I do that. So, so he's the guy who judges everybody in these competitions and he tells them how terrible they are and how awful they are and how terrible. And the truth is, in our heads, we do that. We, you know why I know that? Because I did it driving here today. If I have to pass you on the right, you're a terrible driver, right? Right? You, you have a problem. It's not my problem. It's your problem, right? And so, so we do that with every... And maybe driving's not yours. Maybe it's preaching. Maybe right now you're like, oh, that's about a four sermon. I'm a, it, it's okay. That's normal for humans. But recognize that when you praise God and you're thankful, guess what? It turns off that inner, inner Simon Cowell. You begin to be grateful for what you have. You begin to recognize your blessings. You begin to recognize what you've been given. And I will tell you, if you're watching too much news, it's hard to do this. Did I, did I say that out loud? Okay. It, I want you to know what's going on, but the number of people that posted that a hurricane was coming today was overwhelming. I'm like, what? What? What weather service are you watching? Okay. Number two. I got distracted. Sorry. Number two. Knowing or going. A few months ago, I was on the way home. And if you don't know much about me, when I was a kid, we used to sell lemonade, my brother and I. And, um, uh, and so I really felt convinced that just like when I was a kid, our neighbors and my sisters would come and buy, they would dress up and buy lemonade from us. And it was just a way to kind of show us that they cared about us. And I thought, I want to show people I care about them. I'm going to buy lemonade anytime I see a kid. So I'm on the way home one Sunday. It's one of these Sundays where I think I had new members class and I was exhausted. And I've gotten to where, I, and I tell people all the time, I, I don't know if it's old age or my health, but I just can't go like I used to go. So I'm on the way home and I'm thinking, I can't wait to get home and lay down. I can't get to wait, go, go home and left, lay down. And I'm almost home and then there's a lemonade stand. And I pass it and I start saying, you don't need to stop. You're tired. You're exhausted. You're this and then you're that. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to help them. So I did a U-turn. I came back. I look at my wallet. All I got is a five. I'm like, there's no way they have change. I'm paying $5 for lemonade. So I pull over. I go up and I give the kids five bucks. For, and they oh, we don't have change. I'm like, I know. And, and I get a glass of lemonade. And, and by the way, if you don't know to do this, you need to do this. You pour it out later as an offering to Jesus. You just, so, so don't drink it. Just don't, don't. I used to make lemonade. Don't, don't. Right. So, so, but why do I do it? To support them, to let them know we care about them. So you can know about something. You can know what's right and do nothing about it. You can know what's right and stay on the other side of the road. Listen to what this verse says next. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked. And by the way, this word for attack means he, he fell down. It's the idea of he went down. It's that same idea. By robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, Jesus, what he's about to do, he does on purpose. He calls out the religious leaders of his day. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by 
on the other side. By the way, they would do that for anybody who was unclean. And, and by the way, at that time, if you had a problem, they assumed it was because you did something wrong. So, so, you know, you're suffering because you messed up. You, you must have sinned. That's why God's punishing you. You got leprosy. So it's obvious either you sinned or your parents sinned. Somebody sinned. And so they would see people who were struggling as unclean and they would walk on the other side. That's part of the reason they did it. But a, some, so, and then he says, a priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man, he passed by. And then a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Jesus is hitting all the political parties here, if you don't catch that. But a Samaritan, okay, talk about political parties. The Samaritans had a civil war with the Jews. People died. They hated each other. They worshiped in a different place. They taught things that were not biblical. And so they were seen as enemies, so much so that Jewish religious people would avoid, some, they would walk five miles around town just to avoid coming in contact with a Samaritan. And yet Jesus uses this as a very pointed illustration. A Samaritan as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. Uh, uh, pity is that, this is a word for compassion. It's like deep compassion. It's not like when you hear the song on the dog commercial. And you just, in the arms of an angel. Whatever that song, I'm sorry. It's not that kind of, it's actually deep care for what was going on. So the Samaritan, as he goes by, actually feels for the guy. He went to him, bandaged his wound, pouring on oil and wine. Basically, that was kind of their antibiotic at the time. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. By the way, one thing about love, love is always sacrifice. Love always has to go out of your way. When you're selfish and self-centered, you're not going to do anything for anybody else. You're not going to be inconvenienced. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three, Jesus says to this guy, do you think was a neighbor? By the way, neighbor means near one. I love that. It's the idea of just somebody who's near to you. So where do you help? Somebody near to you. Who's near to you that needs help? That's what this story is about. To the man who fell into the hand of robbers. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. I can almost hear the guy say, I guess. <laughs> but he doesn't. Have. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, a lot of times we think of this story in abstract instead of recognizing Jesus' teaching. Listen, when you're on the way, when you're going through life, who is it that God brings into your path that you're supposed to go out of your way to help? Who is it? Who's your neighbor? Do you have a neighbor who can't mow their grass? Do you have a neighbor who's got a cold and you're a good soup maker? By the way, I bring great canned soup. I just buy the best. Progresso even. I mean, I'll go big bucks on you. I'll even microwave it. It'll be lukewarm when you get it. But. So here's the challenge for you, number two. Use your gifts to bless others. Can I tell you a blessing that you probably haven't thought of? Your presence. We're going to have a beach baptism at 2 o'clock today. And I sent a note to my small group. I said, why don't you all come out and support the people who are getting baptized? Why? Because there's something about just being present with people. You ever just glad that somebody came and said, I'm so glad for you. Oh, my mom's going to hate that I'm going to tell this story. When I was in high school, my senior year was our last concert. I did a solo for the concert. My friend and I did a special song, and I played drums. And that night, I won two awards. I won the National Choral Award and the National Jazz Award for drums, which I had no idea I was going to win. There was none of my family there. I sat with my friend whose family wasn't there. We sat in the back. Every time they called a name, we said who we thought it was going to be, and then it was my name, which was weird, because I'm saying somebody else's name, and then I'm like, what?
Now, my parents said to me, do you want us to come? As a senior in high school, can I tell you what I said? <laughs> if you don't want to come, you don't have to come. I'm a senior in high school. It doesn't matter. But guess what they missed? They didn't get to be a part. And guess what? There's no going back. So who do you need to be there for? Who, who do you need to show up for? And by the way, showing up in our society is so awesome because sometimes it means that you say, hey, haven't seen you in church lately. How are the two babies that have been screaming the whole service, Jill? So, she hates that I do that. By the way, you let them go. You make, make as much noise as they want. I have a grandchild that's about that same age. He better be nice to those girls. Oh boy, those twins. So use your gifts. What's your gift? What are you gifted at? Are you gifted at encouraging people? Are you gifted at just going out of your way for people? Maybe you're artistic. Use the art, whatever it is that God puts on your heart. And guess what? Don't just use it here. Use it wherever God calls you to use it. Listen, we do shoeboxes here for Samaritan's Purse. We send shoeboxes around the world. Can I tell you a secret? We have to take them to somebody else to do the next step. And then they have to take them to somebody else to do the next step. And then they have to take them to somebody else to do the next step. We do our little part. And then guess what? God multiplies it just like the fish. So do what God's called you to do where you're at. And then it's okay to go out of your way and say, where else do I need to help and what I do? By the way, I don't just help at church. I do things for my neighborhood. We have an HOA, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> HOAs have the best fights online now. It's such a joy to watch them fight online. But as a member of the HOA, I decided, you know what? If I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to do it. And I'm not going to listen to people who talk but don't do anything. I learned that as a pastor years ago. All right, Stephen Covey said this, the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. So that means when you're going down the road and you have an interruption, are you willing to say, God, do you want me to do this or not? By the way, sometimes God will tell you no. Sometimes you'll know in your spirit, I just don't feel like I'm supposed to help there. And other times God will say, yeah, do it. And you're like, but I don't like that. <laughs> That's not the point. And so sometimes I help with things that I don't like. Stephen Covey also said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. I knew a pastor who used to take credit for saying that. And then I saw it in one of his guys who was mentoring me, gave me a book by Stephen Covey and said, you might see some familiar things in here. But that's the truth. If you're a Christian, what's the main thing? Loving God and loving people. Don't forget to love God. And love people. It's easy to get caught up in other stuff. Number last. The urgent or the important. Let me tell you about HOAs. This is one of my favorite stories. Years ago, we had a lady in our church who was a widow lady. And she could not maintain her yard. And especially tree limbs and stuff started falling. She had all kinds of problems. And the HOA instantly started fining her every single day. So she called me. She said, do you have anybody at the church that can help? <laughs> I don't think she expected what I did. I called out to the church. I said, hey, whoever wants to go, we're going this afternoon. Don, were you there for that one? Okay. It was a long time ago. It's almost 30 years ago. So, so we got a whole group together. A whole group of us went over there. It was really funny because we all parked in front of her house. And the HOA director came and yelled at us for parking in front of her house. And I had to say, oh, we're here to help her clean up her yard. We began cleaning up her yard. You ready for this? The HOA president felt so guilty that they changed the rules of the HOA for senior adults and for widows that they would go out of their way to help them instead of just simply finding them. It was like the best day of my life. It was great. I mean, when you can change an HOA, that's Jesus. I mean, right? And so... And so here's what this says, this whole idea of they were so busy enforcing their rules that they didn't realize how important that person was. And when they began to be convicted about what they were doing, guess what? It changed their hearts. I love this story, Luke 10, 38 to 42. By the way, I love Mary's and Martha's. We just always have to stay in balance. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. You know how hard it is not for me not to sing, young man? Okay. Uh, uh, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. By the way, this was very culturally inappropriate for this time. And yet Jesus raised the importance of women, and that's what he's doing here. 
listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted. By the way, this is the word that means stuff all around her. By all the preparations that had to be made, she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? By the way, when you're doing too much, that's how you feel. You're overwhelmed. So you say, don't you care? Don't you care about what's important? Can't you tell that eating is important? And eating is important. But the guy who could multiply food was there. And you're worried about toast. And he could make toast for 10,000. Tell her to help me. By the way, when you're focused on the wrong thing, you yell at Jesus. There's an exclamation point here. She's yelling at Jesus, who she invited to her house, and then yells at him. That's what happens when our priorities are off. Let me, let me tell you what that looks like. It's you going on vacation with your spouse because you want to get closer to your spouse. And you get in a fight before you even leave. What's the point of going on vacation? Getting there faster. Right? Getting there in a hurry. Right? And too many times we're focused on the wrong thing. It got really quiet when I said that one. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. By the way, he had to say her name twice. I love that. That's my whole life. Eric, Eric, the Lord answered. You're worried and upset, listen to this, about many things. By the way, that's how worry is, isn't it? Just comes at you. But few things are needed and only indeed one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Now, a little side note. I think Martha could have served just fine if she had made serving worship and not about the activity. And too many times as Christians, we make the activity more important than Jesus. Next weekend, we're going to have the fall festival on Saturday night. And one of the things I always think about is somebody like my grandfather who never went to church until he was way past retirement. And my mom and her sister always tried to get him to come. And I think of somebody like that, like my grandfather, who maybe has moved into one of these apartments close by, and the kids are saying, hey, will you go to church? No. Will you go to church? No. Hey, will you go to the fall festival? Oh, oh well, that sounds fun. How much does it cost? Free. And dad, there's hot dogs. Hot dogs. Free hot dogs. And so the dad comes to the fall festival, and he meets some of you crazy people. And he says, these people are as crazy as I am. I would love to tell you that he says you're as sane as he is, but we know how people are. And because he's been here and showed up for an event and got free popcorn and got this, just this little that we spend and we've, you've gone out of your way to serve and to love, guess what? The next weekend, he brings his kids to church. And he comes to know Christ. And one day we're sitting at the table with him and Jesus says, you know, it was your popcorn. That's Peggy too, by the way. Either that or Randy. Randy and Peggy are the best popcorn makers in the church. I know you did popcorn too. It was you going out of your way to serve and to love. Don't forget that. I want you to encourage you to spend daily time in his word, practicing his presence. Why? Because when you spend time with God, when you spend time in His Word, guess what? It refocuses you, gets you off of what's unimportant, and it helps you realize, who's near to me? Who can I help? God, as I'm going on this journey, I'm busy. But God, help me not to be so busy that I miss the guy in the ditch, that I miss the person that needs help, that I go out of my way to be a blessing to somebody. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, one of the best decisions you can ever make is to turn your life over to Him. And I'll be here today after the service, and you can come and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. Maybe you're here today, and as a Christian, as I talked about something, you thought, I've been really busy with fill in the blank, or I feel like this is something I should do. Guess what? Do it. Do it. If you need help getting to it, let me know. I'll point you to the right, way, right place, to the right people, even another pastor that I might not even like. No, I like all those guys. If you need prayer, I'll be here after the service. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time this morning. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love. I thank you, Father, that even you even use a distracted pastor and distracted people 
And Lord, you call us home and you give us your strength. And by your spirit, you help us to focus on what matters. And you give us the strength to accomplish what you've called us to accomplish. Lord, give us the focus to do what we're called to do, but always do it in your love. May we walk in your love and your grace every day. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great song to close our service. You give what God's put on your heart. Thanks for being here this morning.